I'm resident of Colorwood for YouTube, Joel Sands. That's my buddy Patrick McRae. Uh, we're here to talk some character retrospectives. Burke Devlin and Mrs. Johnson. Uh, Burke uh, Devlin arrived on a train with Victoria Winters. Not that she knew who he was or that he was riding on the train until they both touched down on the same platform and had a conversation. <laughs> um Man, Burke Devlin, played by the late, great Mitch Ryan. Um, what a character, man. He's out for justice, and he's out to get Roger Collins. But hes he wasn't uh, always a rich guy. He was a poor kid. Uh, his father worked really hard uh, with lobster, scrubbing lobster pots and stuff. That's right. Barnacle Alley. Yeah. That's where he's from, Barnacle Alley. Man. It's a comic strip also that cool. ran in the Collinsport Star for years. Cool. What were your th first thoughts when you first saw Mitch Ryan playing this character? I couldn't. I was a kid. I was so young. I couldn't really tell him apart from uh, from uh, uh, Joan Bennett. No, from uh, Joel Crothers. And I just thought, oh, you know, because I started, you know, in two thousand or, or two hundred ten to two hundred eleven, and so you know, I just thought, hey, these two white guys hanging out with the girls, and that was it. You know, it it at the, by that point in the show, it, you know, because he and Roger, have, you know, pretty much made peace and and so on. Um, so you know, it was just like one was the other one with a tie. You know, and so uh, it took a long time for that character to really have any individuality, and I, I didn't really get what the big deal was until I watched the first two hundred, yeah. and then I got it. You know, and I still I go around and around on whether or not Burke is the hero or the villain of mm. that uh, of that first 200 episodes. What do you think? I think he's more I think he's more the anti hero than anything else. He because I do think the writers, even in the early aughts, like Art Wallace. I do believe whether they had meant to on purpose or not, because I don't want to accuse anybody of anything. It froze up their belly. Um, I don't want to like accuse any of the writers of anything. He sort of, I remember reading the shadow and how the shadow would apply the criminals tactics to them. Like he, the criminals had informants, the shadow had agents. The criminals would kill their enemies and use guns. The shadow would use guns. Um, mm -hmm. I sort of more viewed Burke that way a bit because he he's telling you about this family, about that house, how he went looking for ghosts when he was a kid up there, and about how him and Roger were once friends and how they railroaded him into prison and about how they'll, you know, he says, I think he implies they'll lie. I think he's more meaning Roger when he sort of references that. Yes, but he's he he in his mind is applying their tactics to them. He hires a private investigator. He and we're going to give him Mrs. Johnson here too. After Bill Malloy's death, he recruits Mrs. Johnson, who's going to go to work as a cook for Mrs. Stoddard and the, that family. And I, I love the line between him and uh, Clarice Blackburn when she says, "Are they?" Are they all, you know, on off limit? Because she says to him, "Hey, we can't pull our punches. Basically, we can't like not attack them verbally. Like we got to make ac either ask hard questions or make accusations when we can, or you know, there's no point." That's what she's more getting at when she talks to him. And when when Carolyn leaves, I think Burke has a lot of things on his mind. One, he does like Carolyn. But he more has the hots for Victoria Winters by this point in time. Yeah. Um, he doesn't have a relationship with her, but he's attracted to her. Sure. And well, they're beautiful women. I mean, you know, oh, absolutely. What's, what's he going to do? Right. And so he goes, okay, gloves are off. I mean, basically, that's what he's applying to her. If you want to verbally go at them, go at them. You know, but I think the, what Burke does so well too is. He maneuvers stuff against the Collins family to causes that causes Bill Malloy to act. He see 
a lot of credit. I got to give a lot of credit to Frank Schofield's character too, because Frank Schofield's character does see the good in Bart Devlin. He sees him as this hardworking young man who gave him his first job. Um, because Burke, Burke even says that Bill Malloy gave me my first job, you know, <laughs> and it, it also tells you the stand up person Bill Malloy is, and then you sort of see that in Frank Schofield's character. It's such a great, I love Mitch Ryan for how he interacts with people because there'll be times when he's interacting. When he first, when I first saw him on that train, he's back there giddy as a kid, he's like smiling. <laughs> And when he you first see him with Victoria Winters too, at first on the platform, he's like flirting with her until she says, um, he says, after he says, Oh, welcome to the beginning of the end of the world, Miss Winters. He oh, she goes, I'm not going that far, just to a place called Collinwood, do you know? And he loses that smile really fast. And you can see the tone has changed. Now you don't hear their conversation in her car, but when they get to the hotel you can sort of tell there was one with their facial features. She's sort of looking at him and she, he goes, you can take my advice. You can go home. And I love that because it's so quick. And she's just like, uh, no, I'm not, you know, you can tell she's not going to do that. I love how he interacts with different people like Maggie when she, cause when she doesn't recognize her at first, she calls him on it. I love Catherine Lee Scott's like the sass that she brings to that role. Is so good. Right with him and her, it's nearly toxic levels of sassitude. That's why I married my wife. <laughs> it was the sassiness, but it it really is good to see a female because nowadays sometimes you'll see an overbearing you know female lead. You don't see that ever in DS. You just see this natural well, Magda, of, well, not no Magda. Well, I would. I would say, though, too, with that, that at that point in time, we had, with her, she she sort of has to be with the people around her, too, because of in the 1897 Collins family, especially um, Edward, is very, his, his nose is up at them. And Judith, too, to a degree. Like, she, like, her nose is up at the, too. Like, they both want the gypsies out of the old house when when their mother died. They're like, okay, you're, you're out of here. You're out of here when she goes. Yeah. And, and so she sort of has to be that way with them because she doesn't. But she's also out for herself and her husband. She, if, hey, if we can get some money and get out of here, well, I'm good. I'm good. Get the scratch. Yeah, I mean... With the with DS with the early DS episodes, and even even with John Bennett's character, you didn't feel like these characters were being forced down your throat. It's no, something, nowhere near it. I think that's something I always appreciate about the show itself. The characters are so good because they're so natural. The actors and actresses are just so natural at mm-hmm. being those characters. They really put a lot into them. Not just the the writers did the when work. When did that stop? When when did that shift? When 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 did the show become different? I don't think it ever did really to a degree. Not different in their character traits in a sense. I think like if I had to point to and I don't want to harp on anybody, like you know what I mean? I'm not so I'm not people. gonna tell. <laughs> I think the biggest sort of because we've talked about this a bit before. It's such a big plot. It's the boldest idea DS has is the Leviathan art. But it's uh, not, it's not, I don't think it's bad. I just think the writers were just like, it, it almost like you could tell, like they're asking themselves, what are we doing here for the first time? It felt mm-hmm. like you never really, even the pre Barnabas stuff, I never felt like the writers didn't know where they were going. The Leviathan arc is more where you could tell. I think, like, and I love, uh, I want to mispronounce the name, Geoffrey Scott or Jeffrey Scott? Jeff, Jeffrey Scott. Yeah, Jeffrey Scott. I love his character, but once you get past the reveal of the twist of, oh my God, he's a Leviathan, well, here's the thing Angelique's a witch. <laughs> so it's like, okay, that reveal's great, but you know what would make that reveal better sort of if somehow 
they had uh, like a dual 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 role where yeah it's Je we see Jeffrey Scott be that character but when Angelique's not looking we see it's really Nicholas in disguise somehow that it's like in oh. some way that it's Nicholas all along if they would have did that and you get that's why the the reveal of the threat is so surreal instead of having Nicholas play a separate role I think that would have been so much and I'm not trying to Monday morning quarterback I think that right there would have been so much more threatening because a normal person just being a Leviathan and Mary Tangelique it's like okay no offense dude but do you, I want to go up at that moment and ask Jeffrey Scott's character, do you realize how screwed you are that you betrayed this woman? Yeah. <laughs> like, you're the one who's in danger, not her. <laughs> like, it's it's like, I didn't feel sorry for his character. It's just like, uh, once he did it, it's like, once he realized what he is, it's like, okay, but how does that, that doesn't really make him more of a threat to her. You know, it, it just doesn't. It's like, it's the most non-threatening thing you could have pulled off for DS. But I do think, was it good intent? Yeah, I do. I do think the intent's great. But I just think the afterthought of it is, okay, where do you take that? Because he's not really, it'd be one thing if he had power. You know what I mean? If he already had power before joining the Leviathan somehow, and he just joined him because he wanted to. Mm -hmm. Or or if you just make um, Humper Allen Alstrato like a dual play dual roles where he's in he's that guy in disguise somehow. Yeah. That, that's more of a threat to much more of a threat to Laura Parker's in how how would you pull that off visually? I don't know if they could have did where you when she leaves the room or goes somewhere out of town where you then see this, you sort of the, see the character fade out and you see the body transform and then it's, then it's Nicholas mm -hmm. where it's too, literally he's, it's not really Sky Rumson. It's Nicholas. Okay. That's, that's the hint you're getting to the audience. I don't know if they could have did that at that time. I'm just, you know, I don't know. I would have given him horn rim glasses. Really? When he's Sky, Yeah. He would have the same gray suit. Same little gray gloves, everything. But he puts on those glasses, and somehow she doesn't recognize him. She looks away. He takes them off. She turns back. She says, Nicholas, what are you doing here? And, well, my dear, hey, what's over there? And he puts the glasses back on. And then she looks back. She says, he was right here. Yeah. Who's that, darling? Nicholas Blair. Never heard of him. Yeah. Well, I do think because... Sky having Angelique's painting was really great. Like him having that was great because you could have, you could have actually convinced, okay, is this, that's something I initially wondered when he had the painting. Like, is this really like Nicholas somehow? Did they like, but no, they don't. I, again, I appreciate what they tried to, what they tried to do with the character. I do like the Leviathan art. I just think it was a lot on the writers at the time, and the and the, and the and the and the talent, you know. It's a lot to follow up. Eighteen ninety-seven. It is. It's they took the biggest, most successful arc, and it's like how do, we often hear, "How do you follow the greatest thing you ever did?" You know, and that was really dark, dark shadows as well. Talent show episode. Yeah. <laughs> yeah they why did not? Talent show. Right. Now. And I think they had a, they had great additions. I mean, to that to that arc, bringing back, bringing back Dennis Patrick was a lot of fun. You know, I loved seeing joke. him in yeah. playing Paul Stoddard. That was really shocking to me that they had Dennis Patrick play Paul. I wasn't expecting that when I first got seen. Yeah, it really. I dark shadows for you know if pe many people might say a lot of Leviathan arc was a fault, they still took risk. I sure mean, they, they did. You know they weren't. They didn't just rest on what always. They took risk with their storytelling, mm -hmm. and it's something I always appreciate for it. That bold. It was, you know, Justin Beam even said, "Dark shadows is timeless." When yeah. I asked him the questions, 
And he's right. It, like you, you see why it's so timeless when you're watching it, because the ideas, which is like, damn, that's really gutsy for your time period that you're in. Yeah. Because you don't like they didn't have what we have today, technology wise yet, from like, like all the ridiculous CGI, which I don't think Dark Shadows needs. Um, I just think you know, practical effect really, really work well in DS. I think too, like, not to get off the, on the character retrospective. No, I on. think too, I think too, what really works too in the Leviathan arc, and it's sort of the unsung moment, and it, it's before it's well before this Barnabas smashes the altar. What really was the game changing moment was Barnabas burning the antique shop. Oh yeah, when he when he burned that thing. Because that was Jeb's original room. That was the original room they had the transformation. So, it, and when that happened, you sort of did slowly start to see a change in Jeb when he began when he was dating Carolyn. After post room burn. Oh yeah, the monster healed by love is a major trope on the show. Yeah, and it was fascinating. I because Nancy Barrett and the like Christopher Pennock had really great chemistry together. Um, I mean, they were just so natural for one another. Mm -hmm. I think that's something that doesn't get enough credit for the Leviathan art. I mean, because they're they're almost in a weird way telling a, a weird Beauty and the Beast story at that moment. Because, yeah. or, you know, in a way of supernatural creature, where we can make the case that Angelique wanted Barnabas to be supernatural so he could spend the rest of his life with her. With her. He, you have Jeb, who is literally the biggest difference is Barnabas and Angelique were, you know, especially Barnabas was born from a mother and father. Yeah. Jeb wasn't, you mm -hmm. know, and Carolyn's love helping him exist. It's believable because Carolyn had never really been in love before. Not like this. You know, she, she wasn't sure about Joe. She was sure she didn't want to marry him. Her her fascination with Burke is just that it's fascination. Um, you know, she, she had some fascination with Chris Jennings and other than, you know, a tad with Quentin, but it wasn't really that serious with Jeb. You could sort of feel this natural chemistry between her and the late Christopher Pennock. I think is so damn good. It's sort of, I, there's a lot to appreciate in that arc throughout mm -hmm. But I just th I think too, and the, you could tell the writers were just really trying anything to make it work. I mean, they didn't. I would dare say the writers, the actors, actors they never phoned it in. They no, never, they were hard working. Yeah, they worked their ass off, and it's something you can appreciate as a DS fan and go, man, they really gave it their all for you know, as much as like. The arc it may not be the best thing. It had great intention, and it Completely. had it had this great feel of. I remember the first thing I heard when I heard that breathe. I'm like, this is scary as shit. Like that's, that's terrifying. I didn't. I didn't want to be Maggie Evans at that point. And that's a first, <laughs> right? Like, like with Barnabas, you could maybe like it's Barnabas. Is he really going to kill me? With this, it's like, is this woman safe now? Because yeah, no one is safe from the Leviathans. Yeah, no it, and then when you see all the people become, when you know you have this sort of invasion of body snatcher sort of trope too, where people are becoming Leviathan members, it's like, oh my god! Not only who's next, who could be one that we don't know of? They got Liz. Yeah, they. That was a. I really love how Joan played that heel. That was so, so good. I I do, you know, do I have any regret toward it? I My only real small regret is that they didn't make Alexander a heel, uh, bring her back and make her a heel. Yeah, you know, I mean, regrets, I I have a few, but well, then again, too few to mention. <laughs> What's something you loved and maybe didn't like about the Leviathan? Uh, I certainly love the concept and the potential of it. I love the fact that they they delve into these different layers of evil. That you know, not only do you get death, but then you get the snake cult and all this other stuff. 
Um, I I uh, am glad that they didn't keep Barnabas a bad guy. Yeah. And, you know, people like to crack on the emergency episode and, and so on. And I don't, for me, it's just a really interesting twist in the story. Yeah. And that's how I look at it. I, I, you know, again, I like to look at all of this as if it's one story and it's done and that's it. And, you know, a future viewer is not going to know, oh, this was the emergency episode. They had mm. to do this and that. When I was a kid when I watched it, I didn't know that. I just accepted it as yet another twist. And cool. Oh, good. And we got Barnabas back as a hero also. So that was nice. So yeah. when I first watched it, I didn't mind Barnabas being a heel because it's like I understood right away that he's under the control of these these strange beings. Yeah. So you I think that's something that maybe I don't want to say it gets overlooked by fans because I'm not sure if it does. But I think it's, could it be easy to overlook? Sure. Um, I, I love how, because he his vampire powers don't work against him. He can't disappear. They grab him. And they, there's, it's almost like Potofi all over again when Potofi couldn't, didn't let him disappear. And you're, when you realize these power, Barnabas continues to go up against these beings that are really powerful. You're having a Marvel moment. Like, well, now, you know, he's not a vampire when they approach him. Or is he? Yeah, he's in his 1795 yeah. body, so he is. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, that that moment was, like, jaw-dropping for me. It's like, oh, my God. Because like, I wasn't... When they when Patofe was written off, you know, I'm thinking, are they going to have somebody that powerful again? And when they introduce these creatures that... Were when he's in 1795 and he's walking through a shortcut that he's walked through a thousand times and he sees this altar. It's like, wait, this was this was never here. Am I lost? Like they would have made Potofi's hand lift off of his arm and chase him around trying to goose him. <laughs> I believe it. I believe it. Um, I definitely love how too they they place him under their control and then when he comes to. You can tell Jonathan Fritz's face sells a lot. You can tell he knows the stakes, his character. And it's like they have something over him for him to be disobedient. And it, you were wondering what it could be. And then when in the episode, when you find out it's the spirit of Josette. Yeah. I, I, I'll tell you this. I think Dark Shadows really inspired a lot of Star Wars stuff, in my opinion. There's that moment. Oh, the Padme stuff. That that and in in um in Obi Wan, when you and McGregor's Obi Wan Kenobi is apologizing to Anakin, I almost feel there's times Barnabas wants to look at Josette and say, "I'm sorry for all of it." Well, I, yeah, it's so obvious. You know, I mean, he even needs to. You know, it's clear yeah. that he's th this was not part of the the wedding package that he put right. the deposit on. Yeah. I mean, it's. I can almost env envision Fred saying the line the, the way McGregor did. Like, I'm sorry for all of it. This was never to go like this. Or this. Would he then get in a lightsaber fight with Josette? <laughs> he has well, the high ground, Jewel. Maybe, maybe he get. Maybe he gets in a lightsaber fight with Joshua or whoever. <laughs> Maybe. We don't know. Joshua would break a nail and run away. <laughs> um, Jonathan Fred with a lightsaber would be badass for sure. Barnabas with a lightsaber would be amazing. That'd um, be the worst ass. <laughs> it would be awesome. What do you what do you think of Sarah Johnson, the character? I think she's a woman, Jewel. Yeah. She's a woman with needs and yeah. curves. And the softness. Well, maybe not. Guess that didn't go over that well. Yeah, I was making fun of Sarah Johnson. <laughs> no, sorry, I was getting kids. Sorry, guys. It's okay, it's okay. Uh, Sarah Johnson. I think part of Burke's revenge on uh, on Roger is forcing him to eat Sarah's cooking. Uh, fit only 
for somebody oh. like me. That, that's the sound that came out of the bathroom. Okay. Julie, you want to check on that? Mrs. Johnson. Not a lot of personality, I think, but you know, I mean, maybe she does. I've talked about my idea for a Sarah Johnson board game, like the Barnabas Collins game, but you'd be going around the house trying to find little plastic bottles of booze to put back in the liquor cabinet before Roger gets home. And we're back. Sorry about that. Sorry. Well, you turn their lights out, literally. <laughs> well, I turned the electricity that the living room. But uh, I will say that at least I turned the lights off. Uh, but I do think Sarah Johns, you have two characters who want justice uh, in Burke and Sarah Johnson, um, Mrs. Johnson, you know. That she she wants the truth of why Bill Malloy was murdered, who did it. Um, I think if I think Sarah Johnson's one of the most underrated house spies, um, for sure. I mean, she, she never really quit. She sneaks phone calls right in right in Collarwood, uh, under every under a lot of people's nose. Um, I like how she. She acts mad at Burke Devlin in front of David, who is the ultimate Burke Devlin defender. That is one of the most underrated I know. things Clarice Blackburn does. Um, I, do I wish we would have got, you know, a little more afterwards of Sarah Johnson? Because there's, I do think her role gets reduced at times, you know, and because she's not, it had been interesting if they would have said, okay, yes, Sarah Johnson wasn't always this house cook. There's 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 something more to her. And I do think that would have sold greatly. She's such a fascinating character when you first meet her. And she's even when she's on screen, one of my favorite things is how Clarice Blackburn sells Jonathan Fred at the door. And he, she looks like she saw a ghost. And I think that is, you know, great, great actress to sell what, her out. So. What, how would she have reacted if he had had a jar of mayonnaise that was past its expiration date? <laughs> she would have threw it out. She didn't put up with that. No, she did Or if he had had roast beef, a big, big plate of roast beef, she smelled it and said, this she, is past its due. She's, she's, bro, she's caught in a promo about the no one hangs up a thin around here <laughs> the door the who's door. she going to wrestle in the house uh, if she would have got away with it I think she would have wrestled Jason McGuire for not hanging up his coat I she would have sent him crying home to mama you ever you ever see you ever see the Dudley boys when they power bomb somebody that's what that would have looked like what do you think the answer to that question is Jewel <laughs> Probably no, yeah. It's... I've never heard of these people. <laughs> I've never, I have no idea what you're talking about. Well, the Dudley boys would set up a table. Here we go. And, yeah, and okay. uh, at the top rope, uh, Bubba Ray Dudley would uh -huh. power bomb a person through the table off the top rope. What does so, that mean, Jewel, to power bomb someone? To, ha to have uh, your, to have them between your legs, lift, lift them up. And have your face between their crotch and just drop them down. Uh, that's a power bomb. What kind of entertainment are you watching, Jewel? Let's <laughs> let's be honest. I mean, I'm not trying to go go weird here, but um, these are some very peculiar things. Do you, do you do you show your family these videos? And pro, pro wrestling? I don't. My kids don't watch pro wrestling, and I barely like watch it now. I miss the good old days of pro wrestling when it was entertainment. Um, it's yeah. not. It's not entertainment anymore. Uh, I wish it were. <laughs> it's just not. So, uh, give me one. Give me hello. You still there? Hello. <laughs> what happened? Hello. Oh, um, I don't know what happened there. 
Hello. Yeah. There, you, there you are. All right, Kev. I don't know. You froze, Jewel. <laughs> I know. Sorry about that. Um, the but phone wouldn't stop ringing. I know. I, I got I got Halloween fans calling me. Uh, <laughs> about what? Halloween stuff. I don't know what they're calling me for. They want my opinion on something. I don't know. It's like E.T. the night he phoned home. No, I don't uh, uh, because it's like E.T. and Michael Myers. And together. Yeah, so I do like the fact that Clarice Blackburn, her Minerva Trask was really, really good. Um, I wondered how, because intense the character was going to be, and I was really pleasantly surprised how, how well that character came up. I thought it was really better than her Abigail character. Um with, there was a, I felt too they killed her off a little too soon, like Minerva. I thought there was a lot of meat on that bone, um, but you know I get that Gregory Trask was this conniving sob, you know. <laughs> yeah, it it did. I do think that's something, you know, Clarice Backburn doesn't get enough credit for because if her character dies, she often in her character death would put other characters over, whether it was Barnabas, whether it was Gregory Tra Jerry Lacey's Gregory Trask. Um, really, really great character. And I really, old Mrs. Johnson is underrated as hell. In oh, you're in 1995. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, yeah, she is. Because you see a lot of characters who are just broken. Um, and to see, especially now, Stokes is like the one you never thought would break. And that's the biggest surprise. But I think, too, Mrs. Johnson's heartbreak and heartache over the events is so well done by Clarice Blackburn. Now, what, what point of Collinwood is she really talking about when she talks about all the golden days? It was nothing but misery when she was there. I mean, you know, it's, it was there was no happiness. Happiness at Collinwood does not exist. Quentin Collins, 1897. <laughs> maybe, maybe the hat. Well, the happiness for her is in the kitchen. I mean, she doesn't have to eat her own food, does she? I guess not. You know, just one yet yet another form of gastronomical terrorism that she has unleashed <laughs> on the Collins family. <laughs> I, I hear she moved I, I hear like she was briefly in Texas which is why the Sawyer family you know ah. went, went, went to cannibalism you know <laughs> it's roast beef for Uncle Eddie yeah that's right much... Uncle Eddie's more tender so. yeah <laughs> she, she immediately and they allowed her to leave because she said she, you know, she was offended by them turning to cannibalism instead of her, you know, oil. She dish. sewed the leather face. Yeah, she she made the mask for leather face. Yes, yes, absolutely. Here you are, son. There, yeah, here you are. I believe it. Uh, um, it's just two really fascinating characters. I'll ask you this: What do you think of um, the way they did the Leviathan Child? Uh, I just, it's, just, it's very funny. It's very amusing. I liked it. Mm -hmm. uh, I wish that Jeb had been a little more immature to yeah. be in keeping with that. But, uh, but yeah, boy, David J's thick accent, the whole nine yards. Um, uh, yeah, it was terrific. Now, I'm surprised Harry Johnson hasn't been on your lips tonight. <laughs> well, I'm going to talk about him here in a minute. I will say that every time I watch Christopher Pennock's Jeb Hawk, I see a lot of Anakin Skywalker, the poor Anakin Skywalker. He yeah, was, he was immature to a degree. He he didn't he refused to listen to the the his own Bible, his own people's Bible, um, and that was I. That's something I think to Christopher oh. Pennock does not get enough credit for is. A you have a teenager who's really rebellious against the adults around him, Barnabas, mm -hmm. the 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 Todds, and he's more he's more relatable to a young to what Carolyn was when we first saw her when we first met Carolyn's daughter, and it's really really well done by by 
the, you know, the late Christopher Pennock. I will say about Harry Johnson that Greg Slocum, I like what they what they were setting up there where, okay, you have this Alice in Wonderland sort of everybody look like everybody else moment and her screaming at him. But I think, too, the fact that they make him relate it to Sarah Johnson at that moment, I would just, I might have not have did that because it just, she herself said, you couldn't get me, you couldn't get two words out of me about my family to Jason McGuire. And that's, for whatever reason, I could never forget that line that she uttered to Jason. And I don't know why, like even long before Greg, uh, Craig Slocum came, you know, you know, showed up as Harry Johnson uh, because he was a character in the past, Noah Gifford. Um, but I, th I think he's a lot better Noah Gifford than he is a Harry Johnson. I think if you, why not have him be a young deputy? What is your criteria for a Harry Johnson? <laughs> what makes for a good Harry Johnson? I think Harry John, if you really wanted to just make him related to Mrs. Johnson, and he, they set up part of it where he's this criminal. Have it be where you remember how Barnabas tamed Willie, right? We can how Willie changed. Mm -hmm. What if there was somebody Barnabas could never change, and that's that's Harry Johnson, mm -hmm. and he's and even Mrs. Johnson to her face, he's all yes, ma'am, and to her. To maybe you could have him alone in a dialogue like, I cannot wait to slit this woman's throat. Yeah. And you, you have that sort of psychotic member of the family. And I don't think that would have been a bad idea. You don't have to literally have him do that, but have him show where he's very volatile. He's very sort of almost two-faced in, yeah. in, in a lot of perspective. I think I think the idea of the character isn't necessarily bad. I just think you need to make minor changes to make the character a threat instead of a puppet. Yeah. You know, just simple stuff. And again, mm -hmm. the but to, to, to give the writers credit, though, too, I get why they did what they did, because you have a lot more interesting characters around. Mm -hmm. Nicholas Blair, Laura Parker as Cassandra, you know. Yeah. Uh, you know, you're working with that. Uh, you're Robert Rodin's Adam. You just have so many more interesting characters around, and they're much bigger threats than somebody with a knife right now. Um, and, you know, even if they would have went that route, there's no guarantee that would have worked. Um, but it would have been interesting to see. Mm -hmm. They did. They did do. You know, sort of uh, Doctor Jekyll, Mister Hyde with uh, Christopher Pennock. But I think yeah, they yeah. did. To me, they did the best version, in my opinion, of Jeff and I, uh, in a bar none. I know a lot of people might say, you know, there's better versions. To me, there isn't. I think Christopher Pennock nails it out of the park. Home I think run he does. absolutely does. I think uh, John Yeager's a very complex character. Oh, yeah. You know, I don't he's, know if he's evil or if he's just living life to the fullest. Yeah, he's... He's... He's sort of your Willy Loomis so you're not going to convert in every way. But much worse... I mean, because he has a split personality that literally you sort of... John Yeager was always there before the serum. The serum just unleashed John Yeager. Uh, Would John Yeager make a decent friend <laughs> if he liked you? If you basically always told him what he wanted to hear, you were always available to hang out. You, always, you were always his wingman. Hmm. I think to a degree he would have, but eventually it comes to the point of as long as you don't find out his alter e what his alter ego is, I think you would have been okay. Or you're not in not some way liable for where he's he's making you a part of his his game that he's playing. You're his alibi. Yeah. You're always lying on the guy for him. Oh yeah, he was at my house last night. You know. John, yeah, it's Call of Duty all night. God. <laughs> Call of Duty. Uh, yeah, we were playing Hunt Showdown. Yeah, uh, uh, you know, oh, oh. he was he was killing an emulator. 
<laughs> Why not, right? Um, he was he was in a boss fight. He had a he was using a crag, <laughs> you know, a crag rifle. Um, you know, I, God, the weapons and hunt showdown. But uh, <laughs> that's just funny. What about that game where you have to fight the alien bugs? That's the big hit now on uh, PlayStation. There's a there's a two. There's a sequel to it. What is it? Alien Fire Team? No, no. This is the popular game. Mm. It's a big game right now. It's an indie game. They're in trouble, which is not politically correct enough. I don't know. I'm like when I'm play, I still play Hunt Showdown, so I'm not really. Well, hang on. I'm gonna find out what this thing is, Jewel. Is that yeah. a Hunt Showdown's an extraction shooter that I play? So. Oh no, 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 I'm not. Extra, I'm not shooting or extracting. Now, hold on. <laughs> uh, let's see. Find this guy, Johannes. He's the he's the guy, the man with the Midas touch, the spider's touch. Uh, let's see. Um, what is it? It's uh, you know, these funny, funny names. I had a bad time with it, so I just abandoned ship. But uh, what was this? Uh, what was this crazy thing? Um. Let's see. Uh, oh, come on. Um, well, I can't find the name of it, but it's like a big popular game. You should know about this. What is it? Uh, hey, wait, Hell Divers. Uh, Hell Divers so too. I more play RoboCop. Or Are you too much of a commie to play it? Is that it? <laughs> no, I'm. I either play RoboCop, Rogue City, which is a lot of fun. Uh, RoboCop. Yeah, new RoboCop game. Is that on uh, PlayStation? Oh yeah, yeah. RoboCop, huh? They get, they get. Uh, Can they I get play the, Nancy Allen? You could get, you get to play as RoboCop, and hey, uh, the guy who did RoboCop, he does the voice. So. Really, Did Daniel Hugh Kelly. He's great. <laughs> oh my god! Not I mean in the original. Uh, <laughs> oh, the silent version. I never saw that. Oh, oh god, that's just fun. But Robocop Rogue City is really good. Um, Hunt Shadow. I've said Alien Isolation. I've that's what I beat that game a couple times. Now, but, have you seen the Robocop remake? Uh, I did recently. Yes, 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 yes. yes. I really like that movie. I think from a looks, from my only issue with it is the look of Robocop is. I don't know, too. I don't want to say too dark, but it just it feels. I get the, they had good intention with the movie. It's very Hollywood. Well, so was the first one. I was around in 1987. It was not some sleeper indie hit. <laughs> no, it was. I did like um, because Michael Keaton on screen at that point in time hadn't played many villains. Um, and him playing a villain in the in the role was really edgy and good. Um, I, I think it's a much better movie. I think it's a smarter movie, and I think it it for me it addresses most of the logical problems that exist in RoboCop. To me, the the original movie RoboCop doesn't make any sense. There are just things that I mean, it's a triumph of production design, but that's it. And and the new movie sort of relentlessly asks, well, yeah, but what about this? What about this? What about this? What about this? And answers it. Yeah. And I, I respect that about it. Yeah, it does. Uh, Rather than just, it's going to be this way because Paul Verhoeven says so. Wouldn't it be weird if Paul Verhoeven actually were a shitty filmmaker who had a really lame sense of humor? And so after the movies are out for a while, people say, oh, no, it's a satire. If your idea of a satire is a car called the SUX that nobody gets as a joke, and a guy running around saying, I'll buy that for a dollar, and but that's all that's it. That's as far as the joke goes. Maybe it's not a good movie. Maybe Paul Verhoeven's actually kind of a fascist and he really liked Starship Troopers the way it was. And then people said, Babe, you're a fascist. He's like, Oh no, I was I was uh, making fun of them. Here, let me put on my wooden shoes. Have you ever seen the movie uh, Scorpion? The Scorpion? No. Uh, I've got to tell you. Okay. 
Have you ever heard of Tommy uh, Tolliver? No. So he stars in that movie. You want to know why he stars in that movie? Desperately. I no. woke up with this question on my on my <laughs> well because my lips three straight times he dropped our Lord and Savior Chuck Norris in a martial arts fight. Uh and he got a role for it. <laughs> Fuck. Is Chuck that good an actor? Chuck's a great actor, I think. You really Chuck, think Chuck's a great yeah, actor? Yeah, I think Chuck's a really one of the You think he's a great actor? Here here's the thing. Okay. He's He's very humble. I just saw him on uh, Instagram, and uh -huh. he's just so down to earth. I'm sure he's a very nice man. Yeah, you know he. Everything I've watched of his, I've been entertained. Um, yeah, you know, I was big Walker Texas Ranger fan when it was on for him. I have a friend of mine who was on an episode of Walker Texas Ranger. Cool. Yeah. Um, and it's just so. I love his movies. I can't complain about any of them. I really think he just somebody who he wasn't so serious about himself that he took himself too seriously. And yeah. there's, there's been people like that, you know, they're not something I always appreciate for uh, from him because you're so many people talk about him and it's then you see him on Instagram, how down to earth the dude is, you know? Yeah. Somebody, somebody said that Chuck Norris should, uh, fight Mike Tyson. <laughs> I was like, I don't know about that. very old. Yeah, I, I think that would be a very sad... What, do they steal each other's Geritol? <laughs> oh, right. What do they do? Um, but I do think he can act. I think he's very talented. Um, he, again, great martial artist, you know, but I do think that is the Scorpion a great movie? No. <laughs> its budget sucked. Yeah. Um, but it it's an action movie in the eighties, so I was there. Yeah. I was in the mud. Yeah. With my buddies. Nice, nice. What's a if you could have put, let's say, Mitchell Ryan in any big movie role, because he did some movies. What's a movie you would have wanted to see him in or star in? Is Han Solo. Yeah. 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 Uh, I mean, it's moreover, what movie do I not want to see Mitch Ryan in? Yeah. And uh, and that would be uh, the pirate movie with Christy McNichol. I would not want to see him in that. Movie. Um, There's a I, song in the pirate movie called Pumping and Blowing. <laughs> I didn't think well, anyone would catch on. Oh my god. Um I think there's so many roles he could have played. It's hard to just pick one, but um, But you must or your children will die. So <laughs> do so, Mr. Sainz, and do so now. Um I think they uh, again Michael Keaton, I think, is a good actor, but I think they missed the boat on Bruce Wayne and Batman in eighty eight. Um I think Mitch It Ryan, should have been Stephen First. It actor should've... Stephen First who played I... Flounder in Animal House. I think Mitch Ryan, his second career should have been in the 80s, really. He was... I agree. I know. agree. That that would have been if Tim Burton had been interested in making a good movie. Yeah. And I do think that, that even in the 90s, I felt, you know, man, this guy's going to catch on somewhere. The Captain because, Picard. Yeah. He, he auditioned for Captain Picard. He should have gotten that part. Yeah. yeah. It's just crazy to think how many... The Dark Shadows actors did not get roles because they're so talented. Um, you know, it's just like, how did, <laughs> how did you? Some of them didn't even get breadsticks. Yeah, yeah. I think, too, another one that, like, Vora Parker not being, you know, being this huge, huge, uh, you know. What, I, like, I totally agree. There was, like, I forget who, the guy who, uh, Played the doctor on DS9, um, the actor. S S Sadiq Al Fadil or yeah. Alexander Sadiq, as he was later known. Yeah, he was talking about that Hollywood just doesn't call um, the guy who played Cisco anymore. They don't call Avery Brooks. And it's like, why? 
Well, I mean, I get the idea Avery Brooks might not be the friendliest guy to work with. I get the idea that Avery Brooks uh, is perfectly happy at Rutgers, yeah, playing is. his jazz and his piano on his enormous house. And, you know, and, and the other thing is, is that, you know, Deep Space Nine went off the air nearly 30 years ago, you know, 25 years ago. Yeah. It's for you. <laughs> it's um, it went off the air about 25 years ago. And so, uh, you know, I mean, Dun, 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 It's like the, the bionic man. Like, what, what's going on back there? See, this is, I want a reverse angle so we know what's really happening. Uh, Jewel, look what you've done to me, me and my whole world. Jewel, you mean the world to me. <laughs> I got so many people calling. Sorry, I was. Joking. It must be nice to be so popular. Uh, that... I'm just alone and abandoned. I pick up the phone. Someone says, "Hey, is this Danny Hort?" <laughs> no. Uh, well, you are you are much loved on this podcast. Well, thank you. You are. <laughs> oh my god. Uh, oh my. Let me think. I'm trying to think. I don't really have any more questions for you. Um, well, I have but... no more lies. <laughs> oh my God. No, but this has been a lot of fun to just talk to you. Yes, and it is. It I is. Did. If if you now you said about casting Barnabas. Um, let me ask you this: Who would you? Because obviously, you know, who would you cast as Angelique today? It's so rough to like. Is Angelique today? Yeah. Um, he's not really interested. Sorry. No, that's all right, and that's why I would cast her. <laughs> um. I uh, okay. So uh, there's an actress. I'm really torn. Because there's an actress I like, but don't tell her, you know, because I don't want her to know. No, um, there's an actress I like, and I uh, find her uh, religious life to be extremely toxic. And and that by supporting her, from what I understand, you know, you are you know, probably giving money to her church. And I don't like that. And that's Elizabeth Moss, who's a Scientologist, it's my understanding. Yeah. Uh, but I think you need someone I think you have to go for someone who's more than just a pretty face I mean you know a pretty face is fine but you have to go for more maybe Kristen Wiig I yeah. think would be a really interesting Angelique but you have to go for someone where you you absolutely go I get it. Yeah, this is a girl with something extra. This is a girl with some real spark in life and just something interesting going on up here. And not Xenu, um, but, you know, something something else. And um, so I think, I think, uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, there was a, there was a performer who played a pirate on the episode of uh, Strange New Worlds called Serene Squall. I think like like something Jesse James or something like that. I, I don't remember what, what their name was, but uh, th I think they're a really interesting performer. And uh, I would like to see them as Angelique. I think they would be great. Uh, and I, that's, that's a, sort of a, an, an unusual choice, I think, for a lot of people. But, uh, but I think they would be... Um, I think they, they would absolutely get it. Yeah. yeah. It's weird because if she had never did the 2012 movie, I would have said Eva Green. Uh, 
I thought she wasn't bad, you know, for what she, she did. She wasn't bad, but, I, but, you know, here's the thing. You know, here was someone who just knew how beautiful she was and yes. just kind of almost relied on it like a crutch. Yeah. But... Laura Parker worked her ass off despite the fact that she was that beautiful. Yeah. And that was the interesting, interesting quality. You know, you mm. just, you just really... Um, oh gosh, she was just in what poor things. Uh, she's uh, she's in the Spider Man movies, the ones with Andrew Garfield. Um, as his girl, girlfriend, she's an easy A. Yeah. Oh, come on, who's what's her name? Why can't I think Emma? No, is it Emma? <sighs> oh, come on. You've got a computer right there in front of you. No, no, I'm sorry. Why can't I think of this individual's name? They're fantastic. Uh, Emma Stone? Yeah. Emma Stone? Yeah, yeah. You know, there are two types of, of people, and there are two types of performers. There are people where there's clearly clockwork going on up here, where there is there's definitely you know, neural activity going on. And then there are people who just get up and say words other people wrote. Mm -hmm. And she is not someone who gets up and says words other people wrote. She is a, she is a, a, a really active thinking individual. And so, you know, somebody like that. I would maybe go Peyton West, who I think does a lot of the same stuff you're describing. That she really. Why do I know that name? She she was in the Cobra Kai series. Uh, okay. So she's been yeah. in other movies. Uh, so. Yeah. But I think she could make a great Angelique. Uh, I think Mark B. Perry, whoever he cast, he'll find the right person. I really well, no, no, Mark B. Perry is not an actress. Well, you're not but, going to cast Mark as Angela. well if he'll find somebody. Oh, God, okay, you, you were just naming names, and he said Mark B. Perry. I think I probably could do it, but that's that's not that's not his his uh his, his primary goal, his primary calling. Yeah, yeah, I do, I do hope they find somebody who does it justice. I mean, at the end of the day, um, the role was. I mean, the it's writers a, wrote it, but she sold her ass off. Well, it's part. a big casting decision. I mean, it's, I think it was the most important casting decision Dan Curtis made. Yeah, I agree. It's just... And, you know, I was watching episode 212 today. Yeah. And um, and I, 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 I think part of us is a vampire. I don't know. They said no. But there is a there is a feminine pronoun that he slips in, and he said sort of like when she chained up the coffin, not when they chained up the coffin. Well, because I got in trouble because in a day book I mistakenly thought that Angelique had been mentioned before, and it was a rookie mistake. Seriously, it happens a, the because it, because it it just feels like she's been a part of this mythology. It feels like Barnabas must have mentioned her, right? Right? No, I mean you know it just it was it was the sort of thing where the emotional truth of the series overwhelmed the literal truth. But it's very interesting because he does use a feminine pronoun at in one point in that monologue. Father, I have come home. And I did not pay the cable bill or whatever. You know, he has that monologue. And um, and he he mentions a she. So I'm going to say that's Angelique. He says about when you put, you know, the chains which you bound me with are broken. Uh, he which tells, she bound me with. Which, which he bound me with. Which you bound I me with. I heard a she. <laughs> May, I'll say this. This is why Angelique is so rememberable too. Even when you're watching like Barnabas just come out of the coffin. Number one, here's a character that had no build. And it no what? Had no build. They had no build. No up. build. Yes. Like they they didn't mention the character. They had no build up. Yet in in one episode, 
the writers and Laura Parker just get that character over right away. Oh, and sure. Yeah. And, and then from then on, it just keeps getting better and better and better and better and better. And that's why you can look at Dark Shadows <laughs> at the pre at the Barnabas episodes and go, you're you're almost envisioning Laura Parker being there. You know what I mean? Like when you're watching those episodes, like I always that's even, the thing. It's right. like it's like yeah. once you've seen the whole series, it's it's hard to imagine that she was not talked about constantly, but she wasn't. Yeah. But I do think that's the thing about it is though, the writers are like, you know what? We got a really great character here. And they did. They had a great character, but they had a great actress who knew how to sell her ass off. Now, speaking of of uh, of that, so I'm watching 212 today. And another thing happened where Barnabas looks at Willie and says, go, you know what you have to do. I think he was sending Willie to like Home Depot. Because Willie has to start the renovation. Oh, yeah. And, like, Willie has screwed up on paint colors and things like that with Barnabas in the past. And he's really scared because Barnabas is very vague in his instructions. Like, make it look like it was. Like, ah, Barnabas, I don't know how. God, yes, of course you do. Make it look like it was. Okay. Uh, okay. And so, you know, he's there in front of paint chips. Just going, I don't know. I don't know. Does he want the brushed nickel or does he want the the, the polished chrome? I, what sort of fixtures does he want? Because he's going to beat me and I can't buy both because we're on a budget. Julia Frozen. Oh, no, there you are. Uh, I will say that John Carlin does such a great job of being this, this character who goes through this change and constant change. I mean... What an amazing actor. And I think, too, that, I mean, the fact that you have a character who was this thief and this this guy who didn't mind pulling a knife, and then he gets converted by this vampire where he's undergoing this metamorphosis of, of change where Willie is the one guy who's realizing, you know, I was a bad dude and Jason is this bad dude, but I'm working for somebody that you do not want to fuck with. <laughs> You know, oh, and BC, OGC. Yeah, yeah, and I think I love the scene where David, you know, you hear the dogs howling, and he's telling David to get out of the house. You gotta leave, you gotta leave. You gotta leave. And, and he says, No, they're not out there no more. And he's looking right at Barnabas because the dogs have stopped howling. And he and Barnabas goes to the door. He goes, Well, I can't let the child walk alone in the bewildering dark, can I? And Willie's like, oh, Jesus. Like, Willie's got this look on his face, like, oh, Jesus Christ. Like, John Carlin. Oh, gosh. Oh, my God. Him and, him and Fred did not miss a beat. I mean, they were so good. Uh, the dogs were, uh, I think, like, chihuahuas and shih tzus. <laughs> you ever see a Connie Corso? No. They're huge. They are huge dogs. Are they? Can you get a saddle? <laughs> I don't think so. Uh, I, I have no more questions. Um, my friend, uh, is there anything you want to add before we go, before we hit stop? No. No. Uh, link to the Dark Shadows Daybook and Bound is going to be the description box. You can get picked that up on Amazon. Please do so. And by the way, July 5th and 6th, bring your copies because this man is going to sign your copies if you bring them to the event. Weird, weird thing. I may have an extra hotel room. There you go. There you and, go. And I'm not like giving it away, you know, but uh, if someone would like to take it over from me, I'm going to be at the hotel. But I think I've like booked twice. There's something mm -hmm. something weird. So I think there may be two rooms in my name. So if they're sold out and you need a room and you want to talk. There you go. Know. There you go. <laughs> also check out the Collinsport Historical Society.com link. That will be in the description box. Bye guys.